So this is really Silverbow Creek in the Warm Springs Ponds because the ponds are really Silverbow Creek. Um, uh, and uh, it's one piece of a very complex super fun, well, it's a super fun complex. It's, it's made up of uh, three super fun sites and they are Silverbow Creek viewed area here in yellow. Um, and then there's the Anaconda Smelter site here in green. And then there's the Clark Fork Milltown Dam. Um, and as they say, um, as the saying goes, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Um, each of those uh, sites is so massive they had to break it up into operable units. Um, the reason I uh, have kind of, I've given a number of talks on Silverbow Creek itself, um, and recently I just kind of got more interested in the ponds. And the reason I'm interested in them is um, they were under Superfund, they were upgraded, and they did some work on them, and they had a record of decision in uh, Daryl, the mid 90s, I guess? Uh, early 90s. Early 90s. They did some upgrades to the ponds. And the record of decision is an interim record of decision because they said we can't make the final, we, we don't know what the final outcome is because we need to keep the ponds in place. As you'll see, we need to keep the ponds in place until everything upstream is fixed as much as it'll ever get fixed. Then we can figure out. So we're really reaching that point, I think, where uh, they will start discussing what, what's, what's going to be the final outcome for the ponds. What are they finally going to do with them? Um, so for Silverbow Creek viewed area, um, there are, these are the operable units. So Butte Priority Soils right here is where um, most of the work, a lot of the work's been done. There's still uh, the last pieces of work will get done as soon as um, they're trying to sign a consent decree. So everybody, EPA, ARCO, Butte Silverbow Government, DEQ will agree that these final remedy measures will be good. Um, Butte mine flooding doesn't really have an outline, but that's already, um, the remedy's already decided on that. Here's stream side tailings, which we're going to really kind of focus a little bit on. Um, so this is uh, Blacktail Creek coming here. This was the old Silver Bow Creek coming down to here. And then the rest of this is the Silver Bow Creek drainage. That's the Warm Springs Ponds, which is the end of the NPL site. It's the last operable unit. Um, we also have something called West Side Soils. And I know I have it to the east of Butte. But West Side Soils will take care of kind of everything that wasn't taken care of under Butte Priority Soils. Um, and then the last one here, that's the active mine. So it's being managed right now, not as a super fun site, but um, it's being uh, managed as an active mine under DQ, DEQ's jurisdiction. Um, uh, so West Side Soils, right, which way is north, is north, like up? North is up. And so West Side Soils is basically south and east of the Berkeley Pit? It's, 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 it's kind of everything, everything in here that hasn't been taken care of. That's outside in the, that yellow area on your first map, it's in that yep. three, um, the Austria shape. That's <laughs> not in the middle. That's, yes. It's ill-defined at this point. <laughs> but it goes all around. And they're just starting in doing characterization work on it. So here we are. Um, these are the Warm Springs ponds. You have Silver Bow Creek coming into them right here. Um, these are the Opportunity Tailings ponds. And, and I shouldn't say ponds because they're dry. They're now vegetated. Um, the remedy is pretty complete on them. Um, they are, um, tailings are just, when you get your ore, you have to um, crush it and then you mill it to a fine, uh, to sand and silt size. Then you extract the concentrate. What's left over are tailings. So they look like sand and silt. Um, and it's a waste product and it's a waste product that will uh, generate acid and release toxic metals. This was, uh, 
one of the earliest environmental um, management features in this whole Butte mining history. These were started in 1914, and then the first of the ponds, which is pond one down here, was started in 1918. So the, even the Anaconda Company way back when thought it's not a good idea to just keep putting our tailings in the stream and letting them, we're destroying the stream. They also had lawsuits um, of people downstream complaining. Um, but uh, I, I'd also like to bring out that, you know, we have, this is the confluence of three Superfund sites. Um, and so I have them sort of color coded. Here's in blue, light blue um, is Silver Bow Creek Butte area. In this really light blue, are the four streams of the Anaconda Regional Water and Waste Operable Unit. And then, of course, where Silver Bow Creek, Mill and Willow come together and meet Warm Springs Creek, it becomes the Clark Fork. So you have a lot going on in this one area. Um, all of these creeks are under consideration in the Anaconda Smelter site um, for not additional work, but whether they can actually meet standards or not. Um, so anyways, really a heck of a lot going on in this one area, and I'll kind of finish with that. It might end up being confusing. I just kind of put this last bit together um, really recently. Um, so how did we get here? Well, in the early days of Butte in, say, the 1880s, 1890s, early 1900s, um, they just uh, slurried their tailings right into Silver Bow Creek. And so you, you, you built up all these tailings along the creek and storms or flood events would come along and wash them downstream. That's why we have uh, a, an operable unit, Milltown Dam, all the way in Missoula. These tailings made it all the way 120 miles downriver to Missoula. But the other thing was the mine, the way it operated is underground mining um, and open pit mining, you had to pump the water out of the mines. And that, mine, that water was very acidic and just loaded with um, metals that um, kill fish. <laughs> so here is the, um, th this is the confluence of Blacktail Creek and this is Silver Bow Creek. Um, this is when it was discharging mine water. So you can see the two sort of mixing down there or starting to mix. Um, and uh, as why this is so cloudy, I'm assuming that's the uh, huge amount of iron oxidizing and forming particles. Um, but it was discharging at between 9 and 11 CFS. So they're about the same size rivers. Um, you might ask what these kids are doing, and it's a fishing derby. Um, so <laughs> Blacktail Creek was still a viable creek, <laughs> but not downstream of the confluence. So the company, the Anaconda Company, actually started to look at Silver Bow Creek as just part of, another part of their operation. So it was, um, it was a, uh, a water management system for them. So I'm going to show you a couple of uh, pages from some historic um, documents. And it's going to have the precip plant at the top end. And then it'll have the first of the ponds at the downstream end. Um, precip plant just meant that they could take this acid mine water and run it over scrap iron and precipitate copper out. So it was another way just to get copper out of the water. It wasn't an environmental feature whatsoever. Um, this is what's now called, it was called the Silver Bow Channel or the Silver Bow Ditch. Um, more recently under Superfund, it's been called the Yellow Ditch. So here's what I'm talking about. So here's Butte back up here. Um, and you have the precipitating tanks. You have mine water going into the precip tanks. Then it's flowing down here. This is Silver Bow Creek going out this way. The reason they had this yellow ditch come off of here is it went into the top of the tailings ponds. And one of the things it was doing is making sure those tailings stayed wet. 
But the other thing it was doing is, is picking up residual line. So one of the things they were doing in all of this um, is they were controlling pH, right? So everywhere I have a circle, it has to do with either adding lime or looking at what the pH was so that they could start here with a pH of three and a half to four, but after leaving the ponds, they were gonna make sure that it was a pH of seven. Um, and in the meantime, you had, because the tailings, they raised the pH of the tailings up to 11 so that they're not dissolving metals, they're keeping the metals as a, a solid. So um, when you have pH 11 in this water in here, um, you're, you're actually removing most of the metals. But um, anyways, so then 1983, um, this was Silverboat Creek itself was named a Superfund site. It wasn't until 1987 that um, the EPA came back and said, well, what about the mine in this city sitting here? And so they said, oh, yeah, Be Silverboat Creek Butte area. That's the name of the site. Um, so and I have Silverboat Creek left as a yellow line here because it really no longer exists. The only water that ever flows in it right now is storm water in this little piece right in there. Um, so what's Superfund process all about? And I, I, you know, after working in Superfund for a, a quite a few years, I've come to really appreciate this process. And um, so maybe it starts out looking like a simple board game. Um, it's way more complex than that. But um, it's really about a combination of science and law. And, and you know, it was an experience for me as a hydrogeologist to have to work with lawyers so much. But um, so one of the places that um, the law applies is that uh, EPA goes out and they say what laws do apply, and those are called the applicable or relevant and appropriate requirements. But the best example and the one I'll continue to use through this talk is they chose DEQ's um, water quality standard, aquatic life standard for copper. So um, when I say it's a matter of science and law, obviously DEQ 7 standard was based on putting fish in tanks and adding copper till you killed a bunch of them. And you do a bunch of statistics and you repeat it and you repeat it with different organisms, but um, you end up with some kind of fairly um, conservative number that is your standard. The science in Superfund then kind of reinforms that. And so I'm not gonna get into it very much, but along the way you have to say, does that standard actually apply to this river? And there's an ability to say, um, no, maybe we have to waive that standard. And um, that's called technical impracticability. So, um, but in the end, EPA still says it has to protect the environment. So it, maybe it's a TI waiver doesn't say we're giving up. It just says this was too conservative we think we can get by with another standard. So that's where we are both in Anaconda and in Butte, is they're getting down to this final, final decisions under hopefully consent decrees. If all the parties can't agree, um, it, it, it simply says EPA will say what they were gonna do anyways, but they will have to order the responsible party, Atlantic Richfield, to do the work. Um, and uh, yeah, both, I, I don't, I think both consent decrees will go through, but it remains to be seen. So in Butte, the Butte portion of this, and again, that's outlined in red, that's Butte Priority Soils. Um, what's been required was in the creek was remove tailings, rebuild the creek and floodplain, um, and then capture and manage groundwater. So there's a groundwater treatment facility. 
And then there's managed stormwater. So rebuilding the creek, it's largely complete. Managed groundwater, largely complete. There is some more work in both of those, but um, stormwater, that's still a major effort that's out there. So now how about streamside tailings? This is the rest of Silver Bow Creek down to the ponds. Um, so it's removed tailings, rebuild stream and floodplain. Um, and it's at 25, 26 miles a river. So keep in mind, in this case, they didn't think, hey, we could go in and capture and treat groundwater from 26 miles. But this is going to show up again in a minute. Um, it's largely complete. And I'm going to show you kind of what the cleanup looked like. Um, but in, I don't know when that was, probably 2016, 17, maybe even 18, they had to go in and re-clean up some areas. So some of the contaminated areas showed back up after the cleanup. They've done a lot of additional work. So this was just the history of it. So is all I want you to get out of this is it started in 2000 and they were done by 2015. Um, and that, so that's the sequencing. Um, so this is, uh, I guess, the notorious Ramsey Flats. Uh, this was the thickest accumulation of tailings anywhere along the Silver Bow Creek corridor. You can see that this is all tailings, well, tailings and stream sediment, but um, it's probably eight feet thick there, I guess. Um, and you can see it's a desert on top. Nothing's growing because the poor water is acidic and loaded with metals. Um, and one of the bigger problems is that in the summer, groundwater would get wicked up through those tailings. And then when it evaporates on the surface, it would leave salts. And in this case, that beautiful blue color are copper salts. And so the reverse is true when you have a rainfall event on this and it washes off into the creek, you would have a huge spike of copper. And on the Clark Fork, they actually documented fish kills from storm events. Um, and so they gathered both high concentrations of copper in the creek and found a lot of dead fish. So here's how the cleanup worked. Um, and um, so over here, they're removing tailings. So they got an excavator and haul trucks. And um, down here, they have cleaned it up and they've brought in clean material. You can see they're building the banks of uh, the new channel. And uh, is what they're going to do is they'll finish all of this up. And it'll come around through here. And then they'll go back to this portion of Silver Bow Creek, which is still contaminated. Um, they'll take this water and dump it into the new channel and then come back and clean up the old channel and restore that. So the channel ends up in a completely different spot. Cost is roughly $130 million to do this. Um, Six million cubic yards were taken out of here and moved to the Opportunity Ponds. And um, yeah, that, like I said, is largely complete. This is what it looks like from an air photo. So again, this is the Ramsey Flat area. That is the town of Ramsey. This is Brown's Gulch, which is one of the major tributaries. And uh, this is what it looked like in Google Earth in 2014. Um, that's what it looks like on the ground today. Um, there, whoops. There were places back in here, I know they've had to go back in and patch up. Right down here, right outside of Butte, they had to go back in and do a, a bunch of mop up work. So how does this look? You know, like I said, it, it, the, the gauge of, of success starts out with water quality standards. So we're going to look at that to start with. So here's upstream of the mining activity. Here's right at the edge of Butte Priority Soil. So this is where Silver Bow Creek leaves um, Butte. And then we have down here at, at the town of Opportunity, sort of the end of the line. Um, and so this is uh, USGS data, U United States geologic data for copper. 
Um, first of all, I, I was able to obtain, there was the first environmental manager for the Anaconda Company. Um, his name was Spindler. Um, collected data way back here in the 70s. So here we have concentrations of copper in parts per billion. Um, and through time from 70s uh, to 2018. So you can see, and actually Spindler was trying some various things uh, with their water management, and they were making improvements. So this was a maximum value, this was an annual value, I mean a median value, maximum, no average, maximum average. So you, you could see he was improving it. Um, but once they turned off the pumps, it made a heck of a difference. So here's after that. And notice this is logarithmic scale. So um, anyways, uh, this is the history through the Superfund process. This is all Superfund collected data. So let's take a closer look at that. Um, again, I'm going to have three stations, so three curves on here. Um, there's going to be upstream, Downstream of Butte and downstream near the ponds. Um, so, like I said, the standard um, for D, well, the DEQ <coughs> copper standard is not a single number. It's based on the hardness at the time you collected the sample. So, it's a variable standard. So, it's kind of hard to see whether you're in compliance or not with just one number. And so, I could plot it as another. Another, um, another plot that's jiggling all over the place. Or you can form a compliance ratio where you just take the concentration and divide it by this calculated standard. And it's, it's pretty easy to understand. It just means if it's higher than one, you're out of compliance. If it's less than one, you are in compliance. And so this point right up here, this is downstream at Opportunity on Silver Bell Creek is probably 55 times the standard. Um, you also might ask, why were these bumps in here? Because this is kind of important, or this big bump here. Uh, anybody know why 97 and 2011 might affect things? Those were both high flow years. So um, flow, um, flow does seem to affect concentration. So again. Now let's look at since 2013, how has this been looking? So now we're down to a scale where we can see whether it's in or out of compliance. And um, so we can see here that the upstream on Blacktail Creek, and that's Blacktail Creek all the way up at Harrison Avenue. Um, and these are individual samples. So every one of the samples that are collected through these years is represented in these curves. Um, so we can see that even all the way upstream at Harrison Avenue, exceeding standards here, probably there, and there, and there, and there. So pretty much annually. Um, but downstream, it's definitely worse at the edge of Butte. Um, and then when we get all the way down to um, Opportunity, of course, it's even worse. And here we're up to four times the standard. Um, one thing I'd like you to note, the difference between the blue or upstream at Harrison Avenue and at the downstream end of Butte is this gap right here. And we managed to close the gap starting in 2016. You can see it's closed up. That was, that was our sewage treatment plant upgrade. Um, and it was meant to take care of nutrients and it was hoped that it would take care of metals because we understood that there were a lot of metals passing through the sewage treatment plant. And sure enough, it, it did make a difference there. So all the rest of the work under the consent decree is trying to close that gap right there. DEQ, who um, they actually received money from Atlantic Richfield to clean up Silver Bow Creek downstream from Butte. It's called a cash out. Um, so they did their own monitoring. Um, so here's the, here's the array of stations. They had the same three USGS stations. 
um, or they use those same locations, SS1, SS7, and 17D. So those are, you know, co-located sampling. Um, I, and I, I would point out, this is Brown's Gulch, a major tributary, and this is German Gulch, a major tributary. So here's what it looks like from upstream to downstream. And again, I've gone back to, don't be fooled, I've gone back to um, parts per billion, no, this is parts per million uh, copper. Um, but look what has happened. So these are, each of the lines is a year, and these are annual average values. So this is kind of looking at it in a more gross manner. You can, you can, you can um, drill down or slice and dice this uh, data a whole lot of ways and find out more, but this is pretty simple. Um, so we can see between SS1 and SS7, it looks pretty similar from their sampling. By the way, they sample quarterly. The USGS samples eight times a year. So this is a little bit different. Um, but there seems to be this big jump here. And then there seems to be these uh, a couple of places where it really drops. So the drops are when we have those tributaries coming in. Here's Brown's Gulch, and here's German Gulch. Um, and those are unaffected by the mine. They're nice, clean water. But what is going on there, and uh, I'm going I'm to flounder on this description a little bit, but here we go. Um, that's this little reach right in here. Um, uh, let's see, in the town of Rocker. Uh, this is I-15. So if you're familiar, this is I-15 coming off. Um, and if you're ever down there, you will notice there's a wetlands there. It's called the Nistler Wetlands. But is what's going on, and this was <laughs> thanks to my friend Colleen Elliott, who happened to have these geologic maps. Um, uh, so one of the stations is down here, and one of them's up here. And as what we have is a fault running through here, and I finally realized that these are two different maps, probably mapped by two different people. And so what looks like a clear fault there is this green line here. Um, so this is a kind of a major fault. So this is the upthrown side, and this is the downdrop side. On this side is what we see at the surface is mostly granite. Granite are volcanics in that area. So it doesn't have much porosity, right? It, it, and it, so um, if you downdrop this block, somewhere below these um, poorly or semi-consolidated sediments, is this bedrock surface. And it, how deep did you think it was right in that area? At least 1,000 feet. So it's at least 1,000 feet here, but it rises in this direction. And so what I think you have is you have this solid surface here, um, and you have sediments that can contain groundwater. So they form an aquifer, but it doesn't look like that. that basement surface is rising. And so is what you're doing is you're pinching groundwater out to the surface. Hope that made sense. Um, so really, now I, I gave you a story about how does it look as according to uh, water quality standards, but not really the end of the story. Um, we have got fish, despite the fact that we're not needing standards, we do have fish in the creek. Um, and this is one of my favorite pictures because I was out with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, and they were doing, uh, they, they shock the fish and scoop them up in nets, and then they can count them and weigh them. Um, and we had been getting a lot of suckers and uh, sculpin. And this was the first trout, and this was right here um, where the Colorado tailings were, right in Butte. Um, this particular fish is probably the same thing that those kids in that first picture were catching, because um, these have probably come down from Blacktail Creek. So um, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks has con uh, continued to do their uh, surveys of fish numbers. Um, and this is uh, at Ramsey, so that the place I showed you where they had the bright blue slickens and everything, and then that was a 
major cleanup. Um, these are the fish counts through time. And this is just first pass. So this isn't, if they're really going to do a good job, they do several passes and it's a lot more detailed. But this is still a good rough look at what's been going on. So 2007, we get brook trout. Uh, brook trout are blue, cutthroat trout are red. Um, so we can see that definitely had rising numbers. These, these samplings were always done in October. So for one thing, the stream is cooling down. You don't necessarily have more flows, but temperatures have been dropping. So back here in 2016, they said, we need to do the same thing looking at what's going on in the summer. And is what they found was <coughs> summer down here, fall up here, summer down here, fall up here, summer here, fall up here. So anybody know what happened in 2018? Why did both summer and fall look good in 2018? Again, it was a high flow year. There was more water. It probably stayed cooler. So they're doing all right, but if you talk to FWP, they would like to see a whole lot more fish. And this does not meet anywhere near their expectations for the number of fish per mile they should see. So, um, you know, I've been talking about Silverbow Creek, and I want to get now back to um, the uh, Warm Springs ponds. And so we're going to look at, kind of simple enough, we're going to look at what comes into the ponds and then what comes out. And actually, I kind of screwed this up. These are two USGS stations, and my first graph is going to be right from the outfall. So, uh, I put this back into the compliance ratio, and again, this is time along the uh, x-axis. Um, so the blue is Silverbow Creek um, at Opportunity. Uh, yeah, sometimes they're actually meeting standards once in a while. Um, but at the outfall, and Daryl Reed tells me there might be something wrong with my numbers um, in that they did have some exceedances at the outfall in 2018. Is that correct, Daryl? Uh, monthly average. And so if these were individuals, the, that might be correct. These, are, these were individual numbers. I mean, yeah. Okay. So anyways, um, again, 2018, that's why you see a spike there. 2011, high flow years. Again, you see these spikes. Um, but, you know, 2011, according to my record, is the last time we saw an exceedance. So comes into the pond, high copper, goes out of the pond, definitely a much better. Just to talk about one of the discussion points for opportunity ponds is arsenic, because the opposite is true. So what's coming into the ponds, so for arsenic we're talking about the human health standard, and it's 10 micrograms per liter. So if you're supplying water to your community, you better be below 10 micrograms per liter of arsenic. The aquatic life standard, what I've been talking about, um, is aquatic life standards. And for arsenic, it's 150. So these numbers are not enough to bother aquatic life. But if the stream, so the state always wants to have a water body be usable for all the uses. But it, it's it's convoluted for the ponds. So coming into the ponds, Silverbow Creek at Opportunity, it generally meets standards. And these are act annual maximums. So 2013, it exceeded. And 2018, it exceeded. It's hard to tell in 14, but it's really pretty close. Downstream, <coughs> um, worse. So is what the ponds seem to do is they accept arsenic all, all year long, but in the fall and winter and spring, they're storing it. And then when we get into the hot months of the year, there's geochemistry that's occurring. The pH in the ponds is changing, and it tends to release um, that arsenic back in. So um, now we're going to take, this is the part I just 
finish these graphs and getting these numbers uh, actually today. So I'll see how well I can do at explaining this. Um, so again, this is a, a very complex uh, system right around the ponds. And I'm hoping that the agencies and ARCO and anybody else that's responsible kind of considers Silver Bell Creek and the ponds as part of the whole system that includes these creeks um, from the Anaconda smelter and then what goes on in the Clark Fork. And I did some calculations on the Clark Fork, but I, I'm not going to show them here today. Um, but they're pretty telling. So i got to explain loading analysis. And as what I did was I took annual average flows, annual average concentrations for a six-year period, 2013 to, through 2018. And a load just is, you just multiply concentration times flow. And as what it's describing, it's, it's, it's listed in pounds per day, or you could do milligrams per second, whatever you want. But it's a, it's a weight um, of a contaminant over a period of time. And so it is just simply, if you could stand at one spot and count every atom of, say, copper passing by you for a whole day, um, then you could multiply that by the atomic weight, and you'd know the weight that passed by. Does that make sense? So that's a loading analysis. Um, and is what you can do with that then is you can start to, um, you can start, well, in this case, is what I'm going to do in the next slide is I've taken the load here, the load here, and the load here. Because you can simply add loads, right? They're just moving together. And so you can add the load, and so right here at the confluence, you should have whatever uh, that would add up to be. But in this case, um, you know, you have uh, Willow and Mill Creek flowing together and flowing down here along the ponds, and then Silver Bell Creek flowing through the ponds. So really, mostly what I'm considering is if the number down here is different than adding all these together, I'm mostly assuming it's happening in the ponds. It's probably chemistry in the ponds. But it could also be, um, it could also be something happening with groundwater. Maybe you're losing a lot to groundwater and it's bypassing this system. So is all you can say is with the assumption that there's nothing else going into it, I know there's no tributaries there. So here's the number we end up with down here. So it's a negative number. So we have actually removed copper. We're removing it at an average rate of um, 1.09 pounds per day in the ponds. Did all that sort of make sense? Mm -hmm. OK. Uh, so let's look at arsenic. <laughs> so we start out with these numbers. I mean, I guess you can see it right here. Um, that that's probably not going to add up to 2.76. Um, and is what we end up with is 2.95. So it's um, really adding it. And um, like I said, I looked really briefly at what's going on just downstream from here. So you take what's coming, you take um, the USGS station that's already combined the ponds with Mill Willow. And then you combine it with Warm Springs Creek, the next pond, I mean the next source of, of arsenic or copper. And then there's Lost Creek coming in, and you add that in, and then you see what's in the downstream station on the Clark Fork. And uh, for copper, it seems to be that Clark Fork is adding, itself is adding copper in and the Clark Fork itself is adding arsenic in. So ultimately, um, you know, the ponds are doing a, what they're intended to do for copper. So that's got to be a consideration in what are you going to do with the ponds in the end. Um, they seem to be collecting and then adding arsenic at high levels in. But you got to keep in mind that there's arsenic coming in from a lot of sources, including along uh, the Clark Fork itself. 
Um, and that may be a long-term proposition that it keeps doing that because there's not going to be a groundwater remedy for any of this either. Um, Go back to those numbers because that little number, so the 2.76 that you have is smaller than 2.95. And if you add up those other numbers, you get a number that's on the order of one and a half or one and three quarters. Right. So I didn't understand the arithmetic this time. I think I did for the copper. So 2.76, 2.95. So here's what you would do. To, here's what I do. It's bigger than 2.76. Yes, right. But it's only 2.7. It's only 2.76. Yeah, you're right. So I think it was adding about one or 0.96. But there, if you look at the add them up, you have about one point a quarter or one point seven or something. So those add up to right. And, and so you subtract one point seven from two. Six. You're right. Then it's only adding one. I better go back and look at my math, but it does it it does turn out to be two point nine six. Yeah, I think you're right. Other people may be doing arithmetic better than I am. But <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I wasn't obviously. <laughs> and like I said, I just kind of put this as a spreadsheet finally together this morning. So. Um, Maybe that's a dangerous thing I to do, it's but it's about plus 0.95, or it's, a, it's around plus one. If that's the arithmetic you're supposed to be doing, it. yeah, it is. So the arithmetic you would do is you add these together and subtract it, right? And then that you know, if if nothing else is added or taken away, it would be whatever that's added up to be. So no, that's you, you're right. And, and Bev, you're better at math than I am. <laughs> well, I just see a number two point nine. Being right. Than right. Add some other going into it too. And, then, and as I look at that, that lost prick is not in this equation. I mean, no, it's not. Here. Okay. All right. No, okay. warm and Warm Springs Creek isn't in this equation. So here's where this is called Silver Bow Creek. Once you add together the outflow from the ponds to the to Mill and Willow, um, it, it's still called Silver Bow Creek. Okay. So when Silver Bow Creek meets Warm Springs Creek, that is the that is the start of the Clark Fork. That's the headwaters of the Clark Fork. I get. Like I said, there's a lot going on in a little area there, really. Um, so one of the things I kind of talked about was, um, although, and, and I use copper because fish are extremely sensitive to copper. And it seems to be the one that has is farthest out of compliance everywhere. Um, so it's a good measure of uh, of mining uh, um, environmental damage. But like I said, you know we're starting, and there's there's more than just that fish study. There's a lot of other biomonitors that show that. Um, the ecosystem is certainly returning. This has been a huge success. It's just now we're, we're kind of at the point where it's not just copper. And what are the other things that could be affecting this? Now, the problem with that question is that there's a lot of money to fix the copper problem. There's not a lot of money to fix the other problems. But there's certainly, because of Superfund, a lot of information and a lot of science that goes into still trying to understand this system. The Superfund actually has two parts to it. <laughs> There's the part that I've been talking about where you, where EPA figures out who's responsible. They figure out who's responsible that has money. That's the big trick. And then you also find out um, you know, what's the nature and extent? How big? What are the main problems? It's copper in this case, and it was from Butte to Missoula, and, um, you know, these are the concentrations. They have to, in the end, ARCO has to pay for um, um, fixing those problems. But the other part of Superfund is the Natural Resource Damage Program can come and sue they sued Atlantic Richfield for damages. And uh, damages, my favorite example of the damages are groundwater in Butte. So although 
they can manage groundwater here in Butte and, and get it to where it'll be okay for Silver Bow Creek, um, we've lost a resource, haven't we? Um, you know, Missoula uh, uses groundwater exclusively as their source of water. Well, we can't. We get our water from the Big Hole and now from Basin Creek and from um, Yankee Doodle Creek um, up above the mine. And um, so they sued for damages. And so what can they do with that money? Well, for one thing, they've paid for a lot of replacement of water lines. Um, they've paid for the Basin Creek water treatment system. They've paid for upgrades on the big hole um, system. But the other thing they can do is they can, wh where um, they can put money towards restoring the, the, um, the damage system. So, um, the other problems obviously would include nutrients. Our sewage treatment plant still sends out some nutrients. I think it's starting to meet standards now on a regular basis. Temperature is probably one of the biggest ones. Um, we know, that, like I said, with the fish, it's pretty clear that summertime is a real problem for fish. Um, there's flows. There's still water column metals. Those are still probably a problem. Um, and there's stormwater metals, which they're still dealing with in Butte, but those are events that pass through. Probably they're diluted out by the time they get a ways down. I don't think it's a problem all the way down Silver Bell Creek. But um, uh, this was my example. Uh, this is a student I worked with in the past. And this is an um, aquatic plant called Potomagetan. It's also called pondweed. Um, and obviously, it's uh, been receiving a lot of nutrients <laughs> and could, pretty good growth. The trouble with nutrients is that um, it's an indirect effect. So it's not that the nutrients are causing problems necessarily with aquatic life. It's the fact that they will cause uh, abundant vegetation, which can change all sorts of things like uh, lower the oxygen levels at night. So, um, but. Um, one of the sources to, and, and another one is habitat. The question is, when you rebuild 26 miles of river, did you really get it right? Do engineers, can engineers really recreate something as dynamic as a river? And the answer is no, absolutely they can't. They did the best they could. And they used a lot of, um, of uh, principles that people are slowly learning. Um, the, the science of river restoration is I don't know, it's like 10 or 15 years old that it's really been going, and it's still in its infancy. But um, anyways, uh, I think that's about where I'm at. So all of this is aimed at, um, you know, there's more questions than answers. This has been uh, a, very, a very successful effort in a lot of ways. It's huge. And... Uh, <coughs> It's going to be the scientists of the next generation that continue to deal with this. Thank you, Joe. Thanks.